Hello and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we've got an exciting watch. It's a Rolex. This is a Rolex Oyster Speed King. Uh, these date to the 1950s. I bought this one off of eBay as non-running, for repair, needs work, etc. And straight away, you can see that it's in pretty rough shape. Uh, the movement's not currently working and We've got an issue with the crown. It will not screw down to the case. And the crystal looks like it's in pretty bad shape with a big crack on the bottom and it's pretty well worn. So a lot of work on our hands to bring this watch back to something uh, that you'd be proud to wear. But you know what? That's what we're gonna do here. That's what we always do on this channel. If it's your first time joining me on my workbench here, which is also, by the way, my computer table, <laughs> just my desk. Uh, I am an amateur at this, but it's a hobby that I love <clears throat> and that I take pretty seriously. And uh, what we do is we take a little piece of history like this Oyster Speed King and uh, we restore them. And that's what we're going to do here. So let's take a quick check of the balance wheel. That's where I always look first for a watch. It's not running. Okay, the balance wheel does look like it's running freely. That's great news. It means that the balance staff, which is like the axle for that big wheel, isn't broken, which is a common thing that can break on these older watches. But it also means we don't know what's wrong with the watch still. But uh, what we're going to do on this video, primarily to get the watch running, is when it comes to these old mechanical wristwatches, you do something that you don't see that often these days, which is you repair them. <laughs> I know it kind of sounds weird in the, in the world of electronics and such. We don't really repair things very often. You just buy a new one. Um, even if you take it to a re repair place, they'll often just give you a new one or just repair entirely the part that's broken rather than actually trying to fix it. But that's not how we do it with these old watches. The parts are hard to find. They're expensive. Plus, there's a collectible element to watches like this that makes having the parts that were original to it a little more desirable. So we're gonna repair it. And how do we do that for wristwatches? Well, we do it in kind of the most complete way you could think of, which is we completely dis disassemble the entire movement. Every screw, every part, every plate, every wheel, everything comes out of the movement. Then we run it through a cleaning process that thoroughly cleans all the parts. Then we fully reassemble it from scratch and uh, we apply oils as needed as well to try to get it running as good as we can. So we're a little bit of the ways through the uh, process here. Right now, I've decased the movement, so I've taken it out of its case, and I've taken the hands off of the movement as well, and now I'm gonna remove the dial. And you can see the dial side of the movement underneath And the dial looks, yeah, there's some wear. You can see along the edges, there's some corrosion and such, but overall, nice dial, a champagne finish on it. Gives it a nice, they call it a starburst finish as well, which is really beautiful and kind of a classic look. Now we can take off the hour wheel on the dial side. That gives us access to the Canon pinion. This tool right here is a tool, it's a old antique tool I bought off of eBay and re refurbished myself, and it removes the Canon pinion safely. That was a very good purchase. I got that for about $50 and uh, it served me very, very well. You can also use tweezers to remove it, but it's a little, uh, little less safe. So now we can flip the watch over to the movement side. This is where all the action is as far as the timekeeping goes. And the first thing that I like to do with these is to remove the balance. As I mentioned before, the balance staff, the axle for that wheel can be broken quite easily. And uh, just taking it off of the movement while I'm working on it reduces the risk of that happening while I'm actually working. Okay, this is a little tensioner spring and it holds down that right there, which actually goes all the way through to the other side of the movement and that little stick is what you actually put the seconds hand on. This wheel right here is what transfers power from one of the train wheels over to that, what we call a center second. Center seconds means that the seconds hand sits in the center of the movement of the dial on the other side. If you look at older watches, pocket watches and wrist watches when they first came out, that didn't happen uh, very often. More commonly, 
the seconds hand would be off center. It would be down at say the near the six o'clock position or maybe the nine o'clock position. Okay, so we can continue taking things apart here. The pallet fork bridge and the pallet fork comes out. And now we can turn our, uh, turn our attention to the barrel bridge with, with its components. That's what we call the ratchet wheel that, that I'm taking out. And this one here is called the crown wheel. It's got two very, very small screws that hold it into place. And now we can take the click off as well. Rolex is, is probably the most well-known watch brand uh, ever. It's one of the most well-known brands in the world, period. And uh, they have an interesting history. You know, they invented or, or popularized many of the features on watches that we take for granted these days. This one's called an Oyster. And that was the name that they gave to their watches that were... Well, I'm going to use the word waterproof. They're not fully waterproof uh, to the standards of today, but and, and certainly this one wouldn't be as a vintage watch. But these were waterproof watches. These were watches you could actually take in the water, hence the name Oyster. And they have a bunch of cute names for stuff. Like if you ever see a watch that's called an Oyster Perpetual, Perpetual is just their word for automatic meaning that you don't have to wind the watch. Now, this one is not an automatic. This one actually is just a manual wind watch. Okay, with those wheels out of the way, we can take off the barrel bridge and take a look at what we've got going here with the movement. How dirty is it? How corroded? Mm, pretty dirty, not corroded. So that's kind of what you expect out of a watch of this age. Now I can take the barrel bridge, excuse me, the barrel itself out. We'll disassemble that in a minute. That gives us to the real meat of the matter here. This is the train wheel bridge. And underneath it are the train of wheels, which are kind of the part that you think about for a watch, right? The little gears and stuff. I don't know, when I visualize the inside of a watch, that this is what I think of right there. And as you can see, there's four wheels right next to each other. That big one in the middle, and then another one, another one, and then that little silver one's called the escape wheel. And they just come out in succession. And look at that, we've already got the dial side mostly disassembled. This is the setting lever screw. I could just undo this all the way to just pull it out Ugh, like that. And now we can flip the movement over and concentrate back on the dial side again, which is where two main components of the watch live. One of them is called the keyless works, and that's what lets you wind it and also lets you set the time. And the other is called the motion works, and those are the wheels and gears that actually are responsible for making the hands themselves turn. The whole side that we already disassembled, its job is to keep time, is to oscillate at a very specific frequency so that uh, time can be kept off of it. But that doesn't actually tell you what time it is. That's what the hands do, and the motion works are what run the hands. This is a setting lever spring. We'll take that off, and that lets us get to the uh, minute wheel and intermediate wheel here. And that leaves just the rest of the Keyless works here. That's called the setting lever. And we've got a bit of a tricky one here with the yoke and the yoke spring. The yoke spring tends to be a pretty strong spring. So you want to make sure that you get something else on it rather than just the tweezer so it doesn't go flying away on you. It will. You can see I'm using this stick. There we go to make sure that it's stabilized. And then I can just simply take the yoke itself out of the watch. And with that done, I can go ahead and uh, put the balance back into place. This is uh, for similar reasons that I took it off. This is a place where it will be safe. It's not just floating around. And also I can put it into the watch cleaning machine with the balance intact. Okay, so that leaves this, which is the mainspring barrel. This is where the spring inside of it is, is what holds all the power for the watch that runs the whole entire thing. That wound up piece of metal you see right there is what runs your entire watch, no matter what's on it. 
whether it's a calendar or a chronograph, any other features all come off of this very long, very thin spring. And for some reason, the barrel's a little bit stuck here. So I'm just gonna kind of, there we go. Excuse me, the uh, arbor, not the barrel, the barrel arbor. That's what I meant to say. These things have a whole lot of different names. <laughs> Let's take a look at the case though, because this is very clearly in pretty tough shape. It has been well-worn to say the least. And yeah, you can see how well-worn that actually is. I'm gonna use my case knife to take off this. Oh, geez, okay. Well, um, somebody took the oyster thing seriously and took this thing in the water because that is rust. And it looks like it comes off fairly easily. We can take the crystal out now. There it goes. And that crystal is gonna need to be replaced. It has a big crack at the bottom. And let's take a look at what this rust is here. Yeah, it's rust. There's some, some rust and corrosion, but it also looks like it's fairly surface level rather than having eaten away at the stainless steel case, which is kind of the point of having stainless steel on the case. So that worked. And I'm just gonna give this a quick rub down before we put it into the ultrasonic cleaner, because I find that if I just use a piece of pegwood like this to kind of take the big chunks off, then the ultrasonic can really just do the rest. And this is cleaning up actually nicely. So this appears to be more along the lines of staining rather than, you know, rust damage, which is, uh, we're lucky. I'm really happy to see that. Now everything needs to go into the watch cleaning machine. So every single part, every screw, every everything <laughs> needs to go in. And so the little tiny parts go into these small baskets so that they don't get lost while they're in there. And the bigger parts can go into the the bigger basket itself here and there. Everything put into place and we can go to the watch cleaning machine in a minute. But before we do, yeah, so you can see the problem here. That's supposed to be threaded. And as you can see, the threading's completely worn on that. And that's what the crown would grab onto. And if you look at the crown, besides being pretty gross, there's also no threading left on the inside of the crown. So that's gonna need to be replaced as well. So we'll go ahead and take the, uh, the winding stem out, but that crown, that threading, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to, to fix that with this crown, so I'm gonna need to find a new one. And we'll reuse the, the winding stem though. So we'll take these, and first off, let's just put the case into the ultrasonic cleaner, because that's usually the first stop. When I work on these watches, I'll often run the case through the ultrasonic, ultrasonic cleaner multiple times. Um, you know, if you're doing any type of polishing or anything like that, you're gonna wanna run it through the ultrasonic before you're done as well. And this is just gonna be the initial bath for it. It's a detergent that's in there, a degreaser, if you will. It's not a, a harsh solvent or anything. And uh, it uses the, the waves from the ultrasonic cleaner to uh, non-abrasively clean it. So now we can take the parts out of the ultrasonic and uh, I'll rinse them off in water just to get any of the detergent and stuff off of there. And then we can have a, at least a mostly cleaned up watch case. And let's take a look at it fresh out of the ultrasonic. Hey, that's a big improvement. We got most of that rust and debris off of there with the combination of the ultrasonic plus the peg wood. Not bad. I can do a little bit more touching up here. As you can see, there is some rust down in the corner there. So I'll just use my tweezers to kind of free that up. That's underneath the bezel. So it's not a really terrible place to have a scratch. And taking a look, see, look, I need to replace this case tube that's missing the threads, but there's no way for me to get that out of there. It's supposed to have some splines in it so I can use a special tool to take it out. And it doesn't, so I read online that I could try using a reamer. And a reamer is a is part of my staking set. I've attached it to this pin, oh no. Well, I put it on the pin vise to try to use it to free up that crown tube, but it looks like the end of the crown tube came off and the rest is still stuck in the threads. Yeah, there it is, you can see it there. And I'm gonna use this reamer to try to free this up. It's not, well, it's doing something. It's removing the material. As you can see at the back there, there's part of it that's come free a little bit at a time, but it's unfortunately not 
letting the whole tube come free at once. And so I'm going to have to work on this for a little while to kind of get as much of that material out of there as possible. But then I can do this. So I found online a tool which is specifically made for Rolex watches, which is it creates a new thread or in this case, it will refresh the threads because if there's any bits of metal still in there, uh, they could stop the new tube from being able to be threaded in. So I'm going to carefully yeah, re-thread or at least bring back the existing thread in the side of this case tube with this uh, tool. And it looks like it's worked. It feels like it's grabbed on and, and, and reseated into the original threads. And that should take out the any remaining metal in there. Now this is the splined tool that I mentioned before. And what this does is, is these tubes actually have splines in them. Do you see that? And so now I can put this over the special tool and now I can thread it in. So let's give it a shot and see if the threads will grab and if I can replace this tube properly. All right, it's working. I'm being gentle here, but I wanna make sure that it tightens down and there we go. Okay, so it worked. We've got a new case tube on here and look at that, it looks nice too. But for now, I need to remove it again uh, because I've got some work to do on this case. I don't do this for every watch, but look at how beat this case is. It needs a refresh in my mind and I want this watch to look really nice, crisp and new. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for a full restoration here on this thing. So I am going to restore this case as well and I'm gonna do it by hand. So the way I like to do it is using these polishing sticks and these range in grit. And of course the grit is like sandpaper where the higher the number, the finer the grit. So you start at a relatively low one. This time I'm gonna start at 800 because this isn't doesn't have like huge deep gouges or anything. And I'm gonna work my way up to 7,000 and then a polishing paste. That's that's my plan. And yes, that is the dog helping me. <laughs> she's, she's very helpful, <laughs> my polishing partner. And as you can see, it is a lot of work. It just takes a really long time to get these things down because you wanna do it gently where you're not taking away too much material and you have to work your way through up. I think I did six, six different um, grits. And the last one is some polishing paste, which is the finest that, that, that you can do here. I would, I would guess I spent about two hours maybe two and a half hours polishing this. That's, that's about what it took. I watched a movie. Okay, let's take a look at how the bezel came out. Oh, big improvement, very nice. The real question that you face when you do this is how deep of a scratch do I wanna take out? Good example is this case back here that has a very deep scratch on it. And yes, I could take it out but you have to remove a lot of material to get through a scratch that deep. And to me, it's not worth it to like change the shape of the actual object. Instead, I prefer to leave a scratch like that and just polish around it. And that's fine by me. I, it's on the back of the watch. It's like, who cares? Okay, so polishing done. Now we can turn our attention back to the movement where of course it needs to go into the watch cleaning machine. It's gonna go through a three stage clean and then a drying cycle before everything will be finished up. And while I do this, I did want to mention I have a Patreon for this channel. If you like what I'm doing here and you'd like to support me, it's patreon.com slash wristwatchrevival. I appreciate everybody over there. And uh, it's really been great to see it grow. Uh, if you do sign up, you get a thank you card and a sticker in the mail as well, no matter what level you sign up for. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate everybody who supports me over there. Thank you so much. And now you can see the parts all laid out on my bench. That's the entire watch, every little bit of it laid out for your viewing pleasure. As you can see, it's actually quite a few parts even on a relatively simple watch like this. Okay, with that, let's get back to business here. We need to reassemble. First things first, we'll put the mainspring back in and wait for it. Oh, just the best sound. I, I love that part. There's all these little moments uh, when you're putting back together a watch that are very satisfying for one reason or another. And uh, I love putting the mainspring back in the barrel. Now we can put the lid back on the barrel after just lubricating where that lid meets up. 
And there we go. Mainspring back in the barrel and ready to go. <clears throat> we can begin reassembly now of the actual movement. I'm going to put the barrel back in place, but that reminds me, I haven't actually taken the balance back off again after coming out of the watch cleaning machine. And like I said before, this isn't a necessary step. I can re reassemble most of the watch without taking this off, but it's just safer. One slipped screwdriver on that wheel and you're out a lot of work. So let's start with the train of wheels. We're start, we'll start things off by going backwards of the way that we put them in. So that's the escape wheel and then the fourth wheel going in. And you can see they're kind of dancing around. Now the third wheel, this one has an extended pivot. That means that the axle is extra long. And that's because if you remember that wheel that I took off during disassembly, the one that transferred the power over the center seconds, that, that's what it attaches to. And now we can put the center wheel back in as well. And that completes the train of wheels. It's those five, you count the barrel as well. That's the first one. Second, third, fourth, and then fifth is the escape wheel as you kind of waterfall down the movement. Okay, now a uh, order of business. It always is a little bit tricky here. This is getting the train wheel bridge back on. And this requires getting all of those pivot holes lined up on their top and bottom pivots. And this one actually is all four here. The only one that isn't on there is the barrel because that has its own bridge. But we got lucky here. That one actually seated in quite nicely. You do find that sometimes, um, you know, these kind of workhorse movements, they call them, you know, the ones that were in a lot of watches, like in this example from, uh, from Rolex, you know, they, they like to be worked on. They kind of, uh, they kind of fall back into place. We can do a quick check just to make sure the power is running down those train of wheels and it looks like it is. So that's great. This is one thing that if you're trying this hobby out, you'll probably forget a bunch of times, which is to put the uh, setting lever screw in before putting the barrel bridge on. The barrel bridge actually sits over that screw, so you'd have to take it back off if you forgot. Okay, so now we can put the barrel bridge back on and get it nicely seated. before screwing it into place. One more quick check just to make sure that the power's going smoothly through that train wheels, and uh, it is. Now I'm gonna go ahead and use some of my medium viscosity oil here on the point at which the barrel bridge meets the arbor. That does spin in there, and I wanna make sure that it's properly lubricated as it's going to slowly but surely spin every single time this watch uh, runs. So, everything looking good there. Now we can continue the reassembly of the uh, barrel bridge here and go for the crown wheel. It is interesting to see what's happened um, with Rolex as a brand. You know, traditionally it was known as like a sports watch brand mostly, you know, which is the type of watch that you would buy when you go do things like, you know, go, go swim in the ocean, go diving, go hiking, go climbing mountains, stuff like that. Uh, not as a particularly high-end luxury type brand, but... Over the years, especially recently, they have actually transitioned into more of that role as their watches have become harder and harder to actually get. Um, you know, there was a long time where you could just walk in and buy them from the from the store. But that isn't the case anymore, and it hasn't been for a while. And they've kind of moved a bit up market as a result. That's a controversial thing that's happened. Uh, some people don't like that it's happened, and, and some do. One thing that's always been true, though, is that they make a really good watch, just a really solid, well thought out, fundamentally kind of overbuilt, if that makes sense, but in a good way, watch. They, they, their watches are just bulletproof. They last for a really long time. You can 
beat them the heck. You can take them out. You can buy one watch and wear it for your whole life. And they've never strayed from that, no matter what the perception of their company is. So I, I respect them for that. And I think this watch is a good example of that. I mean, this thing's old. And it's still, still here, still looks good, and hopefully it'll still run. We'll find out. <laughs> that's, that's a little more up to us. Okay, now we can caref carefully, there we go, put the, uh, the ratchet wheel, screw it into place. Okay, it's all set. And we can flip the movement over now and replace the cannon pinion again. I'm just gonna use a sturdy pair of tweezers to just gently do that, click it into place. And a little bit of medium viscosity oil here on these posts where the wheels will turn. A little bit of grease on the posts as well. And now we can turn our attention once again to the Keyless Works. Keyless Works is uh, a pretty intense part of the watch. There's a lot of metal on metal rubbing going on. And so you use this blue stuff that you see putting here on the ratchet wheel and the uh, sliding clutch. And this is grease. This is like a, a thicker grease that can really kind of hang in there and take the beating that it gets in this part of the watch. This intermediate wheel can go on next. And the minute wheel. And now I can replace the crown. I got a new one. Uh, as is often the case, I found it on eBay. It is not a new part, meaning that I didn't get like a brand new one from Rolex because, well, they don't sell them. But I did find a, a good condition, period specific replacement. The parts for these watches are very expensive. Just the crown um, was about $80 to get, just if you wanted like an example of what some of the parts can cost for these watches, they're, they're not cheap. Now I can put the yoke spring back in, oh, just like that. Once again, I'm using this stick to help guide and make sure that nothing goes flying away. Cause trust me, it does happen to everyone if you take up this hobby and it is not fun. Okay, now I can use some grease to, uh, well, a little too much grease, there we go, to uh, once again, grease the high friction parts of the keyless works. And now we can put the setting lever spring back into place. It has to sit a little awkward until it's fully tightened down. So what I like to do is get it kind of roughly into place and then screw down the screws most of the way, but not all the way tight, then get it fully seated and then finish screwing them down. That reduces the risk of damage. So as you can see here, for example, I'm not fully tightening down these screws until I can do that and make sure that that part's right. And then I can come back in with the screwdriver and uh, give them a good full tighten down like that. And once again, just a little bit of grease on the end here to make sure that the keyless works, works uh, operates smoothly, like so. Okay, looking good. And now we can flip the watch back over and start the final assembly of the movement. This is, uh, <laughs> we're getting close now to seeing if this watch is going to actually run. I'm really hoping it just needed a thorough cleaning to get back up and running, but you don't really know. That's, that's always the first stop. And then as you go through the watch, you examine parts and look for faults. But, you know, for the most part, I do a full cleaning and uh, rebuild like this, and then I find out what's wrong. <laughs> now, this, this is not seated correctly. There we go. Now we got it. And I can finally 
fully tightened down the pallet fork bridge here. You just don't want to go too crazy on it until you know that the pallet fork is seated properly. I'm going to put a bit of wind in the watch. And what that lets me do is make sure that the power is doing that, which is being transferred down the train of wheels to that pallet fork. The pallet fork's what moves this wheel back and forth. And that means that it is time to put in the balance and see if this watch will run. Oh, this is the, the best and worst of it because <laughs> it's so nerve wracking. Let's see if it'll go. Come on. Oh, it went. Yes, the best feeling in watchmaking when a watch kicks back up to life, even though it has laid dormant for who knows how long, years and years probably, and it is running. Now I can see straight away that it looks like the amplitude's a little bit low. The amplitude is, you know, a way to think about it is how much power is actually making it down to that wheel. And while it does seem to be kicking up pretty nicely, it's running a little bit low on amplitude. So what I wanna do is test it out. Let's just put it on the time grapher right now before we finish the reassembly and just see how it does. Okay, you can see the it's a bit all over the place, but confirmed the amplitude is low. It's at 129 degrees. That should be higher than that. For an old watch, you give you're a little more forgiving. You know, a newer watch will be in the upper 200s, but maybe even 300. But for this watch, it should still be higher than 130. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to oil the watch. Okay, sometimes these older watches are hampered by crusty dried up oil, which you can actually see if you look very closely inside the pivot there, that there is some dried up oil on this watch. So we do need to for sure clean this thing and get it going. And then we'll see if we see an improvement in the, uh, in the running of the watch. And now I can take out both the cap jewel and the lower setting. And then off camera, I'm just gonna oil them, clean them, oil them, and now we'll replace them. and gently replace them. There we go. This is tiny work. I'm doing this on a microscope. Microscope is actually a very handy thing to have for watchmaking and they're not even that expensive. And now we can do the bottom. So this is the exact same process, but it's on the bottom part of this jewel. And I can't seem to get, that thing's really stuck. I'm just gonna use my tool. Oh no, please don't say it ran away. Please, oh, there it is. Okay, okay, we got it. <laughs> Ugh. Little mini heart attacks you get as a, uh, as a watchmaker, especially when you're on a microscope because if it flies away, it's not like you can see where it went. It's just kind of off camera <laughs> as it were. But now we can clean, re-lubricate and now replace this lower shock setting. And that leaves us to kind of an interesting uh, shock setting that they have actually on the escape wheel. This isn't common. Um, it, you, It's not unheard of, but this is not something that uh, is done very frequently that they put a shock setting on. And it's got this really awkward, get out of there shock setting. I don't even know how to take it out. I'm trying to use a piece of Rodico to like secure it so it won't go flying away. Oh, there we go, I did it. So now I can take this cap setting off there with the Rodico, there it goes, clean it, re-lubricate it, and then gently, gently set it back into place. Ideally, that oil would be perfectly centered. I missed a little bit, but it's all within the cap and that's gonna have to do for now. So now I have to replace this, but I don't really know how to use these. And so I'm gonna try to kind of try a whole bunch of different stuff. I'm trying to use the Rodico to secure it. It's not really working. And this thing is proving really finicky to get back into place. I don't know how to do it. What a pain these little things are. Oh no, and now it just jumped away. And we get to play Where's Waldo. Let's take a look if we can find it. Oh, I see it. Do you see it all the way at the bottom below the <laughs> below the balance? All right. Well, I just took everything out. That's the balance and the uh, and the pallet fork and the pallet fork bridge so that I could retrieve this stupid thing. And while I'm here, I'll try to show you something I never really get to show you, which is oiling the pallet fork jewel. It's a very difficult process. And I actually got about halfway where I wanted to go there. 
uh, unfortunately, but that will, will do for now, or I can redo it. But, um, yeah, that's a really difficult one to, to get on camera. I found, but, uh, yeah. Got to see a little bit of it there. Okay, now I'm figuring this out. So the two lower kind of feet go in first, and then I can try to get this top, yes, kind of underneath that lip. Will it go? No, it won't. Oh, it did. Oh, thank goodness sakes. Okay, I got that on there. Now let's see if we improve that amplitude. It was sitting around the 120s, 130s before. There we go, an immediate improvement. It's up to 170s, 180. Um, let's see how it does as far as timekeeping goes. Looks like it's settled in at about plus six seconds a day, give or less. And you know what? For a watch of this age, I'll take it. I'm I'm gonna be okay with that. It's not running perfectly, but you know, getting a really old movement like this to run just like completely spot on is uh, probably a little bit out of my skill set. So I'm gonna be happy with plus six seconds a day and move on. Now we can put that center pinions in there and then I can gently press this wheel back onto place. Make sure it's lined up with the teeth and just like that. Okay, a little bit of oil on the top of that uh, pinion there because remember there's gonna be that little tension spring that holds it into place and I want there to be as little friction as possible on that. This is the tension spring right here. Looks like a lollipop. All it does is just hold that thing down. Okay, and this, this screw holds down that spring and also is the other screw for that bridge. Just kind of dual purpose design. And I just need to make sure that that tension spring stays on top. So I'm just gonna nudge it just ever so slightly like that. Ooh, here, let's see if I, yeah, there we go. And now it lined up perfectly. So we can call that good on the movement. It's running well and it is reassembled. And now we can turn our attention to a few more cosmetic items, which is the dial and the hands. We'll start with the dial. And on this channel, I like to try to have a light touch with dials. Uh, I don't believe in fully restoring them as in repainting them and stuff. I think that they always look worse. So that's just how I approach it. But I do think that dials like this can benefit from a light cleaning with just some water and a swab here by quite a bit. They do actually collect dirt on the surface. Uh, little stains that can come out, that type of thing that can brighten up the dial and just make it look a little bit cleaner. It's just, you really have to be careful with it. If you see the bottom of the dial, some of the lacquer has started to peel. And that's normal, that does happen, but you know, you don't wanna add to that problem, right? So just being really careful here to try to get into the crevices and just take my time with it. Again, this is just water. Now I'm gonna use a bigger, kind of more absorbent um, swab here to, to get the rest off. And then the last touch is I'm going to use a leather buffer to just go over each of the indices and just make sure that any corrosion that's sitting on top of them comes out. And you know what? That dial came out actually very nicely here. Um, it, it, there was definitely some dirt and stuff on the, on the dial itself. And, uh, and I managed to not, you know, mess up any of the printing or the, the dial itself. So, Job done there. Now let's take a look at these hands. And what I'm gonna do is first just try to get this corrosion off. As I look closely, I can see that I believe these are plated, meaning that you know they're brass hands that had been plated with maybe nickel or something like that. And you can see how there's a shiny nickel part and then the brass part. Now, I could replate these. Um, I've never done that, but I could try it. But the issue with replating is that they will come back super shiny. And I think that that's actually not gonna be a good fit for the watch because the indices, it, they won't match it anymore. So what I'm gonna do is just use the same uh, leather buffer here to just make sure that any corrosion is off and give it a little bit of a shine up. And then I'm gonna take a look and see how they look after that. Okay, so taking a look, you know, 
It looks like some of the loom is starting to fall out. It's also turned kind of a not so great black color. So I think I will re-loom these hands as well. And I'm going to just take the time to make sure that the hands are done well, but not overdone, if that makes sense. I just don't want to find myself in a position where I feel like I've ruined the hands or made it so that they don't really match the watch anymore. But at the same time, I do want to give them the care that they deserve. And I think relooming them will do that. So here's my relooming kit. These are actually pretty simple. They consist of a cup, a thing to stir, and then some powder that's luminescent as well as a binder, which is like a liquid that dries up and, you know, turns it, if you mix it with the powder, you know, turns it into a luminous compound that will stay on top of the watch. So you can see I've got some of the powder in the little cup here, and now I can add some of the binder. And this is just a matter of just mixing them really, really well together, nice and evenly. And it looks like it's a little too thin. You want the mixture to be not too thin, but not too thick. You kind of get used to it after a while. So I'm gonna add a little bit more powder to thicken it back up again. You just really wanna make sure that you get this right because if you get it right, it'll go on perfectly. And yep, <laughs> I'm going for the coffee. So I want these to not be stark white, right? If if I put stark white loom on this, it's gonna stand out on the dial. It's like, why are there extremely white markers on this where everything else is this cool kind of like champagne gray vibes? So I just put a little bit of coffee, just a few drops into the loom and make sure that it's mixed in. And it gives it this kind of brown, creamy gray look that I think will go perfect on this watch. My goal here is actually so that the hands don't stand out at all, <laughs> right? I, I want you to not have your attention drawn to the loom of the hands. I want it to kind of melt into the rest of the dial where you don't really notice it. But I think that if the loom is either black or missing, well, then it would kind of stand out. So I'm going for that, that middle ground. And as you can see, I've made kind of a little bridge here with the two pieces of that Rodico. That's kind of that blue putty. And now I can use capillary action here to just gently spread the loom over the hole and it will suspend itself over and inside. This is the back of the hands. So that way uh, any of the extra loom doesn't look all messy on the front. Once you get the consistency right with the loom, this process uh, gets a lot easier. If you have it wrong, it's <laughs> if it's too runny, it'll just go everywhere. And if it's not, if it's too thick, then it won't capillary like this. So it kind of just stays on top. And uh, But once you get it right, it's actually not too bad. Okay, just trying to make a nice smooth layer here. And now I'll just let that sit for about 24 hours and let's see how it looks. You can see it's all dried up. What about on the other side though? Nice, that's perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. It's, it's loom that uh, is in line with the rest of the watch. And as you can see, it looks really nice. It's just a nice kind of brownish gray color. And uh, now we can turn our attention to the rest of the case here. So the first thing we need to do is replace the crystal. I found a new crystal. This one is actually brand new. And this one sits over uh, the case and then the bezel kind of flanks it and goes around it. Looks nice with a new crystal as well. So I'm gonna use my crystal press to push this bezel on now. The crystal is already in place, but the bezel around the outside edge needs to be gently pushed into place, but it has to be done evenly. I've got a special die on the top for this that has a deeper recess so that I can gently and carefully, without breaking any crystals or damaging anything, press that bezel into place and bingo. Let's see how it looks. Oh man, that looks so much better. And remember, I also refinished this whole case, so it's looking really good. The bezel, the case, I got the new crown tube in it. We can do the last parts of the watch assembly here before actually putting the watch together, which is to put the hour wheel and a dial washer on, and then we can actually put the dial itself back on as well. And as you can see here, it cleaned up very nicely. Again, it's not perfect. It's still a vintage dial with some wear, but boy, I'll tell you, in person, it looks great. That sunburst dial is really pretty. So with the dial on, we can now move to the hands. 
Look at that dial. And that's at like pretty extreme magnification. And you can see how that loom turned out as well. If you're curious to see how it looks really close up. So I can put the hour hand on and now I can put the minute hand on and make sure everything's lined up, of course. And make sure it's down all the way. There we go, now it's seated properly. And I can give it a quick test as well, just to make sure that the hands don't bump into each other and that everything's lining up correctly. Last but not least, of course, the seconds hand. And I'm just gonna gently push this on. You really don't need much pressure on that. There we go. That is plenty enough. And once again, just a quick test to make sure that the seconds hand isn't interfering. And it looks like it's not. Now I can get the case ready to put the movement back in and we are almost done with this uh, full restoration on this Rolex Speed King. And I can't wait to see how it comes out. So we'll put the case on and then gently flip it over so now the movement is lying inside of the case. See the watch is happily running away, that makes me smile every time. And now we can test fit with the new crown, remember the crown itself was replaced as well as the tube so that they could be screwed down. That's how they achieve the water, water tight aspect of it. Now I can put the case clamps and the case, case screws into place as well. That holds the movement in place where it's supposed to be. Okay. So that looks right. Now I've got a new gasket for the case back. That again helps with waterproofness. And we can put the case back into place as well. I'm just gonna use this rubber ball to help secure it. They work really well, they're very grippy. And now I can put the crown in and there it is the finished product a rolex oyster speed king from the 50s fully restored and looking great ready for some wrist time again after probably having sat in a drawer for far too many years what an exciting project to have completed thank you so much for joining me on it i'm really appreciative that you take the time to spend with me as I uh, go along this journey into watchmaking. It's always a, a fun one with a lot of ups and downs, and I'm glad you're here with me for it. If you want to find more, um, I'm over on Instagram. It's uh, wristwatch underscore revival, and you can follow me over there. I'll post pictures in between projects and stuff like that. Yeah, you can just say hi or show off your watch collection or whatever people do on Instagram. I hope to see you over there. Thanks once again for joining me, and we'll see you next time.